Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, reviews of comics new and old, to history, to anecdotes, to really wherever our whims take us. We need to talk about Supergirl's first solo series. While Supergirl and her recognizable Kara form had debuted in Action Comics 252 in 1959, it was 1972 when she received her first solo series. From when she debuted, she was a character who appeared in backup stories, or as a support in some Superman stories. She began to have her own canon as she went on, and even did things like join the Legion of Superheroes. She got the from first being Superman's secret weapon and the world didn't even know that there was a Supergirl and then eventually she was public. So she came to feel like over the years a character who could hold her own. Alas, she did not. At least not in this first run which only lasted for 10 issues. It ended in 1974 when it was rolled into Superman Family which is also where Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen and Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane were put. I don't know what I expected when I went into the series but it wasn't this. This series took me down paths that just left me stunned. Sometimes I was frozen or left to reread passages over and over wondering is it me? Did I miss something? Am I mad? This comic was an experience. I laughed, I cringed, I read entire sections with my head down like this. Get ready to experience all of those things and probably more. Let's take a look at Supergirl's first solo series. But before we get started, I'm Sasha and if you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, join us on this comic book journey. The majority of this run was written by Carrie Bates, who wrote all but two of the issues. The two that weren't done by him were done by Arnold Drake, and the artist for most of the series was Art Sapp except for one issue done by John Rosenberger. The inking was done by Saf for a couple of issues, but mostly by the infamous Vince Coletta, who is both loved and hated. Why? Cliff notes speed and efficiency. The man hit deadlines. If you asked him to ink a page in a certain period of time, you would get that page in a certain period of time. But in order to meet those deadlines, it meant that sometimes little fine detail work went by the wayside. A lot of times fine detail work went by the wayside, just big giant ink brush strokes. So some felt that he he would ruin the work of artists and that lots of the nuance would be lost, the complexity. But that is a discussion for another time. This is Supergirl's time. This series starts off with a shift in the status quo for Supergirl. It first seems like this shift is really gonna matter and then it doesn't. Supergirl used to work at KSF TV in San Francisco. This series sees her quit that job, well she'd already quit at the start, and go back to school at Vandar University to pursue a degree in drama. The first issue makes it seem like this series is gonna be grounded in this university plotline, like this is gonna be the foundation from whence all things come. That Maybe she's gonna have a series that's a bit more grounded than her cousins. Issue one's cover of her being crushed by construction equipment is representative of some things in this story, so props for that. The text, however, is not. Supergirl battles a laughing killer forever beyond the reach of justice in the trail of a madman. The Joker? Where? I kinda wish. This opening teaser page reminded me that Supergirl used to be called the Maid of Might. I was happier not remembering that. It needs to go back into the memory box along with Daredal. Supergirl is moving into her dorm, which she has to do quickly because they moved up the date. So because of this, she doesn't get to meet her roommate, a girl named Wanda Five. Instead, she has to hurry to make sure that she can register. And on her way past the theater, she hears a scream. Using her x-ray vision to peer inside, she sees a student on the ground. At first, she assumes it's rehearsals, but then a girl runs out past her in a panic. And when she goes in, she realizes that it's murder. What an exciting first day. She meets the prof and director of whatever play they're producing, a Basil Razlov, whose name is a takeoff on Basil Rathbone, a golden age of Hollywood era actor, known to most for playing Sherlock Holmes. This Basil has a past as a Hollywood actor, but now he's teaching at this uni. And this year, they're about to present a series of his plays that he starred in as the lead in the movies. His most famous roles. Oh gee, I wonder who did it. I'm sorry, but I've been around the block a few times with these theater murder plots. They are a staple of many a genre. Also, this is almost exactly Basil Carlo's origin story. But let's go through the motions. Kara learns that the girl fleeing the scene was her roommate, Wanda Five. And when she confronts her, she learns that she has ESP. This is, as it was called at the time. And so she sensed that the murder was going to take place and she was going to try and stop it. But she couldn't. She got there too late. And she couldn't stop the other one either. But there's a third one that's going to happen and they're going to try and stop that one. It's at this point that Kara has been told that all three of the victims were the leads in the plays that this director was directing that he has previously starred in. So Kara is able to save the third would-be victim and make it back in time to meet the other girls in her dorm, Carrie Blake and Sheila Wong. I read the letters panels as I went through these and one of the things that people were really excited about was Wanda Five. They wanted to know what was her angle? Where is she from? Was she going to figure out that Kara was Supergirl? Well, wonder forever because she never comes back to this series. Also, one of the letters asking about her started roasting the editor, or rather the comic, for calling it ESP instead of Psy, which they said was more scientific. So good. Issue 2 takes things in an entirely different direction, with a story involving the bottle city of Candor and sickle cell anemia. Death of a city. Kara is on the beach in her civilian guise, so as 
Linda Danvers, and she's with somebody called Jeff, a friend who it's hard to care about because you have never seen him before. He's just some guy, but for this issue, he's Kara's guy. She has to ditch because she spots trouble out at sea, a man being attacked. He's being attacked by two giant octopi, and it just so happens to be her bio professor, Alan Forsythe, her biology professor for her drama degree. It's probably an elective. She saved him as Supergirl, but changed back into Linda to go to the beach. So really, she didn't have to change because nobody saw him in the water but her, so she could just gone in and got him and come back and no one would have been the wiser. But she changed back to Linda to give him mouth to mouth and then we have drama. Jeff sees her giving mouth to mouth this unconscious man and assumes that she's cheating. Jeff is the worst, but don't worry because after this issue we never see him again. Linda takes this prof back to his lab and he delivers some great period appropriate attempt at commentary cringe. Why don't you take a little vacation from work? Sickle cell anemia never takes a vacation from killing black children. But then why were you at the beach? Our last Jeff sighting has him dumping Kara after he sees her leaving the prof's lab. But why was he at the prof's lab? Who are you really jealous of, Jeff? Supergirl is low-key falling for Alan and goes to check on him, only he's passed out again because he's dying. Like right now in a few hours. So how is he planning to cure sickle cell anemia in this time period? And now I'm really wondering why he went to the beach. Well, Kara can't have him just dying. He has such wonderful work to do. So she takes him to the Fortress of Solitude. This is so that she can go with a bottle city of Candor because they have the finest doctors. They can cure him of anything. But does that mean they can also cure sickle cell anemia? Is Clark just sitting on all this medical help for the world? I have questions. You see, this is opening questions that it shouldn't. The scientist slash doctor that needed to cure him has died, but he had notes on his last discovery in his tomb in a mountain. They just have to go there. Some obstacles and Alan going blind because he's hardcore dying later, they get there. They're gonna cure his mysterious unnamed brain ailment with some mushrooms that was, that's the cure, it's like a panacea thing. Only it has one side effect, it's gonna make him huge, which Kara didn't know because she didn't wait to listen to the recording which said it just after she gave it to him. So he could destroy the bottle city. So Kara Kara has to leave, enlarge herself, and then reshape the bottle city using glass blowing so that she can get him out as he expands and then reshapes the city. Does he ever cure sickle cell anemia? I don't know, we never see him again. Next, issue three. This is the issue I pulled the cover from to put in the community tab. This is the one where Kara is crying for what is the use of being a superhero and saving people if you can't even get a date. I have Peter Parker's number. It sounds like you two would get along. Supergirl uncovers the garden of death. This episode opens at the university with Kara's roommates, or well, Linda's roommates, who are now Terry Blake and a girl named Sabra. I don't know what happened to Sheila. She dropped out, I guess. I will fill in these gaps with my own headcanon. They can't stop me. But that doesn't matter, Sheila or Sabra. What really matters is who is going to take Linda to the dance, the Valentine's dance. Well, apparently she's supposed to be going with some guy named Bob Lewis, but he's mad because Linda is not going on dates with him because she has rehearsal for a play for the program she's in. Bob sounds like a winner, just like Jeff. And her reaction to him rescinding his invitation to the Valentine's dance because, you know, she's doing school things is... Very period typical. This is very much playing into what someone assumes girls of the time period care about or what they think they should be caring about. Oops, I just lost a terrific date and I was so anxious to have Bob really dig me. Her Romeo, Frankie, well the guy playing Romeo, tells her that he too has been ditched. And you may think, okay, so this is what we're going for. It's kind of a romantic drama setup. Who will she go with a dance with? Haha, <laughs> that's not what they're setting up at all. This was all a clever ruse that she could go check on Frankie's girlfriend, Marianne, because she's been acting odd. And she goes there as Supergirl because she might not confide to Linda Danvers, but I think I've got a better chance of getting through to her as Supergirl. I mean, I would have gone with the opposite, but I don't control the plot. So this girl, Marianne, broke off her date with Frankie because her dad has just been accused of murder. They say he's killed a gangster, Lucky Coin Lacey. They found a body in his prize-winning exotic garden. Supergirl decides to go there because this girl's convinced her dad is innocent. But while she's there, she finds three more coffins because they found the body in a coffin. Three botanists who were examining his garden. But this panel where they find the coffin clearly shows they dug it up. Why? Did the garden look suspicious? Were they trying to steal some of his exotic plants? Help me, issue three. It looks like her dad is very guilty. They found a knife in Lacey's chest with his prints all over it, but Supergirl is still convinced he's innocent because his daughter is and because he said so, but she is actually able to prove this in a little escapade that involves her nearly being eaten by a giant Venus flytrap. But guess what? That was all part of the plan of Lucky Coin Lacey. That's right. This man was framed by the gangster he was supposed to have killed. Lacey hired a plastic surgeon to transform one of the gang members found in the garden to have his face, but then he changed his own face to have Albert Brooks's face. 
that's that's her father, Marianne's father, Albert Brooks, who is also an actor, but you know, similar names. This is so that he can kill him, take his life, and restart his criminal empire, and also have a really nice garden. I mean, that's why I'm assuming he picked him. There's absolutely no other reason for him to have done so. But Supergirl figured it out because he was always flipping a coin like Two-Face, and so when she went to look at the corpse, she saw there was no metallic residue on the fingers. Haha, -ha, foiled. So she captures him. Marianne is in a better mood, you know, with her alive and exonerated father, and so she goes to the dance with Frankie. But Supergirl has no date, so she cries outside on the grass. I mean, you could have gone alone and hung out and maybe met somebody if that's what the goal was. Someone better than Bob. These university men have been terrible so far. Issue four. This cover is just a lie. It's not even close to what happens. I feel like there was a breakdown in communication somewhere. I mean, sorta, you'll see. Supergirl becomes her own worst enemy in The Borrowed Brain. How can I battle him when he's part of me? It says here the writer is Gary Bates. That's lies, it's Carrie Bates. Why does no one on the series care? I care. So this time we open and Linda's at a pool party with Terry and Sabra. I sure hope she meets a boy there. Extra points if he's a jerk or evil bonus round if he's both. This is David. He's doing his post-grad work in criminology, which he should ace because he's the leader of a gang. He's going to college's cover, as we see when he hands some blueprints for a heist to his gang. Did he get them from the university? Nope. He's literally just going so that he has an alibi. Because no one would suspect a student. That's the same reason he wants to date Linda, for the cover. I mean, yes, he has an alibi, but if they find the plans and trace them back to him and he gets a cut, well, he's still going to get in trouble. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. But he flies too close to the sun because he decides he needs to have an even better alibi. There was a quake that happened earlier and Supergirl had to leave to deal with it. And it made some things in the bottom of the pool at this party uneven. And he sees that there's a jagged piece and Terry's about to dive right into it. So he decides he's going to save her. Then they'll never suspect him of anything ever again. But in doing so, he dives down and smacks his head right against the jagged edge and really badly injures himself. Supergirl rushes into the hospital, but there's no hope. So it's off to Candor to sponge off their medical resources. And they say he'll be fine if they can just do a brain cell transplant. So she extracts some of her brain cells and gives them to David. David must get well. He must. David's fine. He's better than fine. Because her brain cells have given him superpowers. Powers he will use for evil. So he makes a costume and decides to go buy the super scavenger. He'll use his powers to stop petty crimes and progress, then take the money. He also figured out right away how he got these powers, so he made his mask out of lead. The first heist he goes to stop is actually the bank robbery that he gave his gang the blueprints for that they were using because they just abandoned him after he got injured. That's ice cold. Well, he may have hit his face, but he didn't take off his watch. And Supergirl was paying attention to all those diamonds on his wrist so well she sees that it's David. And thanks to plot convenience, his powers just fade. He's pitching him and Supergirl being great together, but she just turns him in. And I'm a little sad because David actually had some good villain potential, but we never see him again. Say bye, David. Issue five. This is one of the stories written by Arnold Drake, and it's it's a story. It's definitely a thing I read. Sabra and Terry are going on a folk dance weekend, but Linda can't go because she's got a family thing. Also, she received a mysterious book in the mail in a language that none of the girls can identify. Suddenly, Linda feels faint, but she can't deal with that. She has to go to a thing as Supergirl. Her and Superman have to take some kids to an amusement park. On her way there, Kara's powers fade more and more to the point where she has to take the subway there. Does she tell Clark instantly? No, because there's kids that they need to take to an amusement park, and that's that's what's important. And the big red alert here is that one of these girls, Rowena, doesn't think that Supergirl is cool. Kara's got to fix that. Priorities, dates, and the youths liking you. Gotta be hip with the youths. Superman flies his kids in a taxi to the amusement park, and she just has to take a regular cab. Clark doesn't even ask. He does not care. Very on brand for him at this time period. Rowena just hates Supergirl for no reason. It's kind of amazing. That's a cute watch, Rowena. A little boat peep and her sheep. Yeah, Supergirl but I can't forget you're not flying us to Funland. Once they get there, they go to a haunted house and Rowena's just making fun of Supergirl the entire time and saying, oh, is it too scary for you? And then she vanishes and Supergirl has to go try and find her. But as she's doing so, she feels faint again and collapses into another dimension. There she meets Dax, the dictator of this other dimension that's sitting alongside hers. He sent her a book that opened a portal, ripping their dimension. Did he send her the Necronomicon? <laughs> he also stole her powers. There's nothing super about you now, except your costume. Ah, Dax is a fan of the hot pants. He wants her to quash a student uprising and he kidnapped Rowena to get her to cooperate. And he thinks that she'll be able to do this because she looks like a goddess from their world, Urani. Supergirl does lead them to the trap, but she can't ultimately fully betray them. She knocks out Dax and leaves the students to their victory. I don't know how long that's gonna last, but she's gotta go. There's kids waiting at an amusement park. And she made the most important victory. She saved Rowena and now she thinks that she's cool. I just learned Supergirl's really super. 
I really dig her now. Issue six, Supergirl's stolen kisses will cost lives. No, they won't. Nothing like that happens this issue. This is another Drake story. In it, Supergirl saves a former gang member from a street gang called the Flaming Serpents. This is Rick, and he used to be a member of a gang called the Hustlers. But he's since turned his life around, and now they do good for the community. They rebuild buildings, they refurbish things. They're just really great to have around. Supergirl decides that she's gonna butt into this gangland warfare and decides to try and broker a truce between the Flaming Serpents and this now ex-gang. She gets them to agree to try and meet to talk about a truce, but while they're waiting, a truck suddenly nearly falls on the leader of the Flaming Serpents. And so, it's all-out war for who else could have done it except for these do-gooders who are repairing their neighborhood. So they start trashing all the good work that they're doing, destroying the buildings, the construction. She wraps them up in asbestos. Oh, those people are gonna have problems later on. But she's able to figure out that the person who did it was one of the members of the Flaming Serpents who wanted to move up. And so she stops him. The, the end. That was a thing that happened that didn't need to involve Supergirl, but did. Issue 7, co-starring Zatanna, who are fighting each other over the sinister snowman. Zatanna was a backup feature for five issues of this series. Four were actual stories, and the fifth was a reprint of her origin. So when it says surprising team up, I feel like it's not that surprising. She'd been around. If you were collecting this, you would have been like, oh, Zatanna. So this story brings back the university more concretely as a framing device, or rather a place with infinite people that Kara can date. This time, however, she's at a protest about POWs, and she has the name of one on a bracelet she's wearing, a man named Tony Martin. He was a man that she saved from a car accident. Oh, what a dream boat. I thought love at first sight was just for fairy tales until now. He was writing her letters every week, or while he was writing Supergirl letters. I don't know how he knew to send them there, but he did. But you know what? He was a two-timing cad, because he was also dating Zatanna at the same time. He met her at one of her stage shows where he volunteered, and she too was taken in by his magnificent mustache. But he was lost in the Himalayas on a mission with the Peace Corps, and Supergirl decides she needs to do something, but just about him, not the other POWs. Again, this story is opening up a can of worms that it does not want to open, but it's gonna anyway by accident. After some casual races, and the depiction of the people of the village, she learns from them the demon Orgox, a being who lives in the mountains. And she learns that Tony was going up there to disprove that demon's existence. Was that his Peace Corps mission? Why was he doing that? Spoilers. It really was a demon. Zatanna and Supergirl are at odds when they first meet up on this mountain, but they find they need to team up to defeat a giant snowman, and they do. Did I mention that Bates was back? Yeah, this this is Bates' back. They also rescue Tony from the very real Orgox, but wouldn't you know it, he had a fiance. And yet he was romancing not one, but two superheroes, taking his life into his hands, I see. Both girls feel that they were fighting over nothing. I mean, they were always fighting over nothing, though. Creep City. Issue 8. This is one of my favorites, this one and 4. In this story, Supergirl gets transformed into Medusa, or at least gets the snakes in the hair. The teaser page also lies and claims Superman is in this issue. <laughs> who do they think they're kidding? He doesn't care what she's doing. This is the same Superman who left her at the orphanage. The story's called A Head Full of Snakes, which is also slang for someone being crazy. I see you. Don't think I don't see you. Linda is actually, total shock and awe, in class. She's starring as Medusa in a play, and a boy named Mitch is playing Perseus. And and Linda has spent three weeks of rehearsals waiting for Mitch to notice her, and it looks like finally he is. But when he shoots his shot going for a kiss, she has to dip because their prof is about to get mugged by members of a city gang who decide to go to university. What, were they talking to David? I kind of wish they were. Please have anything in the series connect, please. She stops them, but when she's gone, it's real that they have been turned to stone because she suddenly has snakes on her head, just like Medusa. She tries to burn them to death in a geyser, but that doesn't work. Her prof tells the police that Supergirl has become a Medusa, and they just believe it because, well, why not? So Supergirl menaced all eyes. The Justice League try to take her out, but they get turned to stone. Well, really, it's Hal, Bruce, and Carter Hall. So Green Lantern, Batman, and Hawkman. But I only wanted to tell you about that because it really happens quickly and doesn't impact the story just because Hal is flying Batman over there on a flying carpet. And I love it. I love everything about it. I can show you the snakes. Then you'll turn to stone. The real Medusa starts communicating with Kara telepathically. She wants to possess Kara's body when she is killed, and Perseus has possessed Mitch to just that end, and she's convinced for some reason that Mitch, who is just a regular guy, is gonna beat Supergirl. He does not succeed, and they destroy Medusa, and Supergirl goes back to normal. Bye, Mitch. Issue nine. I can't do nine, by the way. Like, I can't, it hurts. Ah, oh, issue nine. Supergirl becomes an Amazon. Also, Nubia is in this one, but she spends most of it unconscious. This one keeps you on your toes because really, where is it going? Why is it going there? Who knows? We open on a cliff outside the university where Dale is making out with his girlfriend. When suddenly the cliff gives way, so it's Supergirl to the rest. Rescue, but oh no! Dale? Dale? My boyfriend? 
Dale? I mean, I guess we've never heard of him or seen him until this moment. I mean, <gasps> Dale, how could you? Poor Kara. She confronts him as Linda and he just confesses and is genuinely the worst. He even snaps and says it's her loss when she runs off. So she flies off as Supergirl to try and clear her head and do some good. There she sees a plane that's careening out of control. So she goes to stop it, but then she gets lectured by the man flying it who says that she ruined everything. It was a test flight. Doesn't she know what she's doing? Silly woman. Woman, who needs them? Men, who needs them? But this hasn't put her off men entirely yet, at least not for this issue. More needs to happen. She sees an idol being mobbed by his fans and she goes and saves him and then he tries to accost her with a kiss, a gratitude kiss, saying, you know, try not to faint. He's just so much. Well, that's enough for Kara. She decides she needs to go somewhere where there are no men. As she's flying, she sees a ship full of Amazons. Well, a couple of Amazons and they're being attacked by shark men. Queen Apolta and Nubia are among them, so she swoops in to save them. Hippolyta keeps calling Nubia my other daughter in a move that is clearly meant to clue in the reader because it sounds so forced and unnatural, especially because Diana isn't even there. Hippolyta is so impressed by Supergirl that she invites her not only to become an Amazon and live with them, but to become her adopted daughter. Kara is done with men, so living on an island full of ladies sounds like the life for her. She aces all the tests really quickly, and then she gets the crown, the belt, the boots. She's an Amazon. But oh no, Nubia is dying of shark poisoning from when they were attacked by the shark men, and there's only only one route that can cure her from this island. If only Wonder Woman were here. Oh wait, now they have Supergirl. She goes to this island, Kalogi Island, which is not a real place, but it looks like it's supposed to be Easter Island. And then she's attacked by stereotypes. Witch doctors, big oof. Much cringe. They actually are magical, so they sap her powers, but then they're attacked by a giant white gorilla. Only it's not actually. It's a Chinese man named Fong in a gorilla suit. He claims that it's his island because his descendants were stranded there generations ago, and he's the last one there. And this gives him claim over the island for reasons. But Fong is really more interested in reenacting Swept Away. That movie where the man and the woman get stranded on the island and it gets real rapey and weird. Fong's favorite movie, probably. According to the laws of my ancestors, now that I've saved you from death once, I'm responsible for you from this day forward. You're just an ordinary female now, and you'll do as I say. Ow, Fong's grip is hurting my arm. I, I didn't mean to hurt you, Kara. I'm sorry. Maybe now you'll accept fate and not try to reject my protection. What a fix. I think Fong means well. No, run Kara, abuser alert. Kara escapes, she manages to knock Fong out. She steals his gorilla suit, gets her powers back, and gets the root, and then goes back to the island to save Nubia, but not before going and looking at Fong and thinking about him fondly. I don't know why. In fact, this encounter with Fong convinces her not to stay with the Amazons. She says that it wasn't fair that he kept her locked away on an island, and so she can't keep herself locked away from saving people. I can kind of follow the logic, sort of, but why? Why Fong? Guess I'll give men another chance after all. Not Dale or Fong though, please. Who am I kidding? Don't worry, we never see them again. Last issue. And this story is actually two stories. Two stories in one. The first is a tie-in with the comic Prez. Oh boy. Prez. Prez was a comic about a teenage boy who becomes president of the United States and appoints his mom as vice president. It was meant to be all encouraging and kids can change the world. I'm telling you, overt stuff like this always ages poorly. You have to be a genius level writer to make it timeless. Voting is cool kids, you too can become a teen president. The fact that the story exists at all also messes with canon that had been established that Prez was taking place on another earth. But having this first story be Kara saving him from multiple assassination attempts means that it kind of roots it in canon, but then it doesn't end up actually mattering any Anyway, but just thought I'd mention it. That's the story, by the way. She just goes around saving him from these various assassination attempts while he's being wholesome. Here he is fixing this boy's watch that his dad who died in Vietnam gave him. Fixing watches was a character trait for Prez. His name was actually Prez. His mom named him that in hopes that he would become the president. He's Prez Prez. The fixing watches thing or fixing clocks as well was part of what got him elected. Prez was a time. I do like that the villain in this first story has both a witch who is practicing voodoo make a voodoo doll to take out Supergirl, but also has a death ray. He's covering all his bases. After that pointless interlude, we have our last true story of the series, Her Brother's Keeper, featuring Super Lad. For some reason, the narration boxes of this story start off in second person. You were on the campus of Vandara University peering through a powerful electron microscope. I don't know, I guess this last story really wants you to imagine that you are Supergirl. This is Dr. Forte, who specifically asked for Supergirl to come to his lab via Linda Danvers, so he could ask her to steal money for him to continue to fund his research, which is never concretely laid out. It's something involving the human genome. I don't know, but it vaguely sounds eugenics-y the way he describes it. I'm scared. An explosion in the lab proves to be a ruse that he's using to harvest some of her cells. This so he can make a clone version to do his bidding, but he makes the version a boy for reasons. Actually, he says, 
is an accident, but he doesn't care because he needs that money for science. Can he not get some money by demonstrating successful clothing? I mean, mostly successful. At least there's something in that. He can sell off parts of this. He doesn't, I think he just wants to be a super villain. Super girl meets super lad and is pretty calm about all of it until she sees him rob a bank. And he has no idea why she's mad. He has no concept of morality at all. He doesn't know much about anything except what the professor told him to do. I don't understand why you want to take my money from me, super girl. He manages to evade her, but in the process, the bag is ripped and so there's a trail for her to follow. Then super lad wants to know about his origins. Where did he come from? The professor just tells him, you're a clone. Or as he says, a synthetic being. This actually gets real dark. It culminates in there being a ray gun and super lad has to decide, is he going to shoot his creator or super girl and just ends up shooting himself? Farewell. Super twin. You manufactured synthetic life, Dr. Forte, but you couldn't manufacture evil. The end. Or is it? As mentioned, this comic rolled into Superman family. So I went to check where any of these threads picked up in that comic. Well, I only had to go two issues into that to know that they dropped this like a hot potato. Issue 165, which is issue two of this collected book, but they took the numbering of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen as it was the longest running of things being combined, is the one where this ends. This issue starts with a Supergirl story that begins with her packing her things because she's graduating. She's about to go get a job as an advisor where she's going to help teens. This so she can do even more social issue stuff. Oof, oof. None of the characters or threats that were mentioned because established would be too grandiose a term for anything that happened in this series come up, rendering this entire run in the long run pointless. Now a series doesn't have to make big moves to be good. It can just be enjoyable in its own right for what it is, existing in its own little space in the universe. The thing is, this series is a mess. It never figures out what it's doing or what it wants to be and so it's constantly fighting with itself. Is it a teen romance slice of life with some superhero action? Not really. The focus on Linda's social life falls flat because it's only ever one or two panels and she never feels any conflict about doing Supergirl things. No one ever wonders if she's Supergirl so there's no tension and none of her supports do anything and most don't ever reappear. So it just feels like plots and characters are constantly being dropped, because they are. The roommates who are established just slowly fade, and even when they were there, they contribute nothing because she never really interacts with them in a meaningful way. Wanda 5 was a complete waste, and one wonders what went on behind the scenes to have her dropped like that. The men are another thing entirely. The fact that there are so many isn't the issue. It's that none of them are set up or appear more than once, so you can't care about them or their relationship with Supergirl, or rather Linda. Again, there's never any kind of tension about that. She She's there crying about Dale, her cheating boyfriend, and we met him mid-cheat. The adventures themselves feel very random. Some are tied to her being in school, but many feel like that is just a thread to try and make things seem connected that actually aren't. These stories just happen, and some feel like fever dreams. Oh, Zatanna and Supergirl fighting a snowman over a man with a mustache. They're not well constructed, and they hop from place to place, and scenes just happen, and they feel like padding. Like, the Justice League did not have to be in that Medusa issue at all. Some of these stories also lack that fun factor factor that makes the suspension of disbelief easier or even desirable. But one big positive is that Supergirl stands on her own. You don't miss Clark slash Superman or the other mainstream DC characters, and it does feel like she can hold her own. It's just that she's not given anything else around her to build lore upon. The issues that feature Clark or members of the League for those brief moments aren't better than the rest. In fact, their inclusion feels tacked on and like a distraction. It serves to make her feel more disconnected to the world and not part of it. It makes it feel like this comic isn't doing its job. One of the funny things is that there was a letter that actually asked where are her parents and the editor replied with don't worry they're coming it was lies. Thankfully, this comic doesn't try and tackle too many social themes. The few that it does, it kind of does really clunkily. Sickle cell anemia never takes a vacation from killing black children. It's also very period typical when it comes to its depiction sometime later on the other side of the island where the ominous witch doctors are performing a voodoo ritual. In all fairness to this series, while it had moments like this, it did also have a diverse cast of characters. It's just they never did anything really, but I mean, nobody did in this series. Look at this botany group digging up that coffin. Again, why? Again, the biggest strength is that Kara is likable for the most part in this series, even with all the nonsense about her only needing dates. There is potential here, and it just feels like it's been squandered. There was fun to be had, and some of the stories have this kind of vibe where they're trapped in between being Silver Age and Bronze Age, again, because we're at that cusp. So they have the Silver Age plot lines, but presented in that Bronze Age way, like we're supposed to take them more seriously and think about them more. And then you have ones that are more Bronze Age, but then have Silver Age elements that feel tacked on. This comic is a mess. I can see why it was cancelled before the great DC implosion that happened in the late 70s. And I will count it as a cancellation because the continuation that happens in the Superman family has nothing to do with it.
nothing to do with this. This series showcased a lack of knowledge of what to do with Supergirl that would alas continue. Should she be a student? Should she focus on dating or action? Should she help Clark? Does she need to be around at all? That would be the decision that would be come to when she's killed off in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Maybe they just reread this and they were like, nope. Supergirl will get her own book again in 1982. This one lasted 23 issues and then she got killed in 1985. This series, I'll never forget it. But those are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. I saw some comments when I posted that image in the community tab that remembered this series quite fondly. So I want to hear from you. Did you read this series and what do you think of it? Do you like this costume? Are you here for drama student Kara? Do you feel that the super scavenger had potential? What's your favorite or least favorite issue? Share all your thoughts down below and while you're down there please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking the time of your day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.